Hello to all of our dear friends. We're very happy to be back with you. It's yet another Wednesday. We're broadcasting from New York. With you today are your instructors, Leo and Vlad. Uh, again, we're very happy to be with you because we have a very special, very unique lesson today. And the, this lesson is really one of the fundamental topics of the wisdom of Kabbalah, the topic of free will. It's really a huge topic, something that yeah. will follow us for, for pretty much for, for, for the rest of our path on, you know, to, towards adhesion with the Creator, to, towards spirituality. Um, before we start and before we actually delve into the topic, we wanted to ask you a question so that you would answer it and we would be able to um, kind of work with your question, w w with your answers and, and present the topic to you. So th right off the bat, we start off with the question, okay? Uh, an interactive uh, part of our of our class. Think of an example from today, from this day today, when you were completely free to choose something, and share it with us. Again, think of an example from today where you were completely free to choose something. And Leo, I, I can I can right away answer this question, right? Today. And we wrote uh, it by the way, just yes. so you have it. Mm -hmm. So so today, uh, during lunch break at work, I went to a deli and I requested a sandwich. And I thought, what sandwich do I really want to have? So I asked for a roast beef sandwich, specifically with, with, uh, with onions and with uh, uh, pickles? lettuce. Pickles, that's why oh, I love pickles. pickles. Oh, no pickles. No, pickles. No, 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 pickles. Oh. Pickles and olives. And olives. Okay? I picked every single precise uh, um, topping that I wanted to be in the sandwich. I ate it, I enjoyed it, and I knew that this is the sandwich that I picked. I chose to have the sandwich. This is the, 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 the freedom of choice that I exercised at that moment. Okay? So think of an example such as this. You know, think of something that you, you did today. Freely. Freely. That you chose to do something. Okay? <laughs> and as you contemplate that, I just want to welcome everyone who is with us. We have really Long such list. Uh, such a diverse list. I mean, I'm, I'm always so amazed by how many people study with us. I mean, it's 8, 8 p.m. here in New York. We have, uh, we have people from, uh, you know, Raguel from India and, and George from, from Ghana. Uh, we have uh, some friends from Jamaica, from Brazil. I see Jamaica, yes. Of course, New York, St. Louis. Uh, Tracy from Montana, Francisco from Brazil, um, who's been with us. Uh, we have Rhonda from North Carolina. Uh, who else? Matthew from Vermont. Peter from Hamilton. Uh, Michael from Florida. Brian from Florida. Phyllis from Bastrop. Uh, Edgar from Texas. But it really shows us the, 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 the whole wealth of this desire that we have for spirituality, that people... Regardless of what time it may be, some, for, for some of the friends that, that, uh, that Leo just, just, just mentioned, it's, it's deep night. For some of them, it's early morning. And, and the people still, no matter what, no matter what time it may be, they're, they're waking up or they're, they're uh, uh, pushing away whatever, whatever other plans there may be, and they're connecting to this, this lesson. It's really inspiring to see you, friends, being really serious about, about the subject, because really it is the subject of our lives. We are discovering our true life here. And, and let's also remember, when we sit there, when we gather here, that this is not a regular lesson. I mean, we're not here to teach you about some history. Um, we're not here to really discuss things philosophically. We're talking about the development of our desire and, and how and by which means we can develop it, how we can draw the light that will grow our desire, develop it in, in the right direction and get us to this state called the adhesion with the Creator, connection with the Creator, the upper force, um, through the connection between us. I mean, really, this is what this is about. Let's not lose track of that as we go through the lesson because it all talks about kind of rearranging our internality in order for us to, you know, attain that and goal. It's all about how do we rearrange our internality, how do we change from within in order to truly receive what is on the outside. And um, last lesson, uh, if someone by perchance missed it, uh, our friends uh, Marcus and Mutlu, uh, they covered the, um, uh, you know, the, the significance of our study materials. Uh, w you know, what are we studying? 
the books that we study, specifically the book of Zohar, written by Rashbi, uh, the book of Etz Chaim, written by Diari, and more specifically the study of the Tenth Spirit by Baal Sulam and, um, and the writings of Baal Sulam and the writings of Rabash. Uh, and as a, as a reminder why these books uh, in particular are so important to us, more so than the other books of, um, of importance that are also important, is because those books were written after the shattering. So they discuss our state, our starting point. We are in a shattered state. We used to have those connections between us, and now those connections are were broken, were shattered. So that's what was ruined. That's when we talk about the destruction of the temple. That's what was destroyed, and that's what we're trying to, to build between us, rebuild between us. What was truly destroyed is the, is the, is the correct relationship <coughs> between us, and that the correct relationship between us is the key to our common discovery of, of the spiritual reality. So, Vlad, we have... People sent a few things about free will. Quite a few. I, I noticed. Oh, you notice. Vicky mm -hmm. says, I chose to thank God before I got out of bed. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Ken from Austin says, I chose to come to the lesson. Okay. Beautiful. Um, I, uh, Monty from North Carolina says, I chose uh, to take a walk right before the lesson. Uh, Paul from Virginia, I hope I pronounced that name correctly, uh, chose to study Torah and Kabbalah. Mm, Tracy Ray from Montana chose to sleep in, listening to the rain. Larissa from New York bought a lovely summer outfit. She chose style and color. She looks very beautiful in it. Nice. However, Stephanie from Georgia says, I don't think I've been completely free to choose anything today. Okay. Okay. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> and Francisco from Brazil... Uh, is uh, you know is a staunch uh, resistant. A free will says, "Nah, I bet it's a trick. True freedom is very hard to come by." <laughs> Everyone from Texas chose not to have a haircut nor trim his beard. A true procrastinator. We're with you. Edward. Nice. Uh, and Michelle from New York chose to exercise today. Uh, all right, so you know we talk about free will, you know, very freely. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, you know, it's been on everyone's mind from, you know, the beginning of time pretty much. Uh, and, and we tend to see ourselves as, you know, free creatures, right? To, to make our own decisions and, you know, uh, you know, express things this way or another, act this way or another, uh, you know, change our minds about things, right? We, Individuality, of course, comes into play. Right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, but... Uh, but what Kabbalah uh, is really helping us see, um, it really helps us kind of increase the resolution of what we call free will, right? We kind of go deeper into that. And when you start to peel the layers and look deeply into that notion of free will, we see that it's not so, you know, clear cut. Exactly. Right? It's not so black and white. It's mm -hmm. not so black and white at all. Um, there's a quote here from uh, Baal Sulam. I'll remind everyone. We're starting from, do you have another copy of that book? Uh, which one? The, uh, the, yeah, Kabbalah for the Student. I just want to just remind the mm -hmm. friends that uh, we're, we are studying from Kabbalah for the Student, uh, the book that contains really everything we need. Mm, as, as fundamental uh, students at the very least. Everything. Um, Absolutely. So we're reading from page 375 from article The Freedom. Uh, we're I actually have have a excerpt there, but 375. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. But the, uh, um, the, uh, the 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 topic of freedom in itself has has been something that that people have been obsessing over for 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 centuries. If you think of of, of how many peoples and how many different uh, ethnicities have been proclaiming freedom and fighting for freedom and giving up their their own lives for this this thing that they uh, deem to to be called freedom. Right for so, so, so for so many years, um, and in terms of freedom of choice, about uh, uh, slaves wanting to to not be slaves anymore, right. um, of of uh, um, people who were under under a certain siege by 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 a foreign you know alien country, uh, alien force. Uh, uh, we're, uh, yes, we're under un, under some siege from from an, from another force right now. We feel insecure. We feel uncomfortable. We feel uh, like something's missing. And and this this constant sensation of this uh, uh, incessant need 
for realization of freedom. It's ingrained in us, and it's there for a reason. Look at all the civil rights movements uh, in, you know, in America, freedom you know, of, of, you know, of women, of, uh, of black people, and, and like yeah, the sexuality. sexuality, all those, mm -hmm. different, all, the, all those different freedoms right, that we you know, fight for so dearly. And, um, and of course, I, I truly believe that, uh, you know, the, that those people really genuinely felt that felt that, you know, the need to kind of... And, and what, what we're here to, to talk about, uh, along with, with many other things, of course, but, but uh, you know, in this particular context, we, we want to convey that, that uh, this need for freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of, 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 of uh, religion, freedom of, of speech. speech, you name it, any type of freedom, as a matter of fact, is something innate, something that comes from the very root of our existence. It comes from the Creator Himself. Now, today what we're going to do, we're going to examine just how free are we with all of the actions that we're taking, just how free are we in regards to corporeality and spirituality, and what do we need to do, what do we need to change within ourselves in order to achieve the true freedom, the true spiritual freedom that Kabbalists speak to us about. So... With this idea, let's now read what uh, Baal Sulam writes and see what we can get out of this. So, uh, Kabbalah for the Student, page 375, we're reading from, from the article aptly named uh, The Freedom. It is a general view that freedom is deemed a natural law, which applies to all of life. Thus we see that animals that fall into captivity die when we rob them of their freedom. This is a true testimony that providence does not accept the enslavement of any creature. It is with good reason that humanity has been struggling for the past several hundred years to obtain a certain measure of freedom of the individual. Yet, this concept expressed in that word freedom remains unclear, and if we delve into the meaning of that word, there will be almost nothing left. For before you seek the freedom of the individual, you must assume that any individual in and of itself has that quality called freedom, meaning that one can act according to one's own free choice. And that brings us to a very interesting predicament. Do we have it? Do we have free choice? Or do we just have the illusion of free choice? Uh, Let's return to the basics, right? <laughs> What are we, right? Remember what, what Leo and I and also Mutlu and, uh, and Marcos have been, have been talking about for the past eight lessons. Today, by the way, is the ninth lesson. So. True. So uh, what have we been talking about all of this time? We spoke about the fact that human beings, the created beings, are a will to receive. That anything and everything that we do, anything and everything that we devise and, and contemplate, anything that we think at any moment of our lives, comes from this nature of ours that is called the will to receive. That at any given moment I am constantly calculating what will this particular action that I'm planning to do return to me in terms of, in terms of whatever, surplus, dividends, you name it. Right? Basically, it's a basic formula of... Um, Calculation. Of how do I get... You can show it, Alex. How do I make... More pleasure <laughs> compared to the effort I have to put in. Right, this yeah. is this is this is kind of like in in in, in the, the way merchants deal, right? I uh, you know I want to give something for the greater value than it actually is in order to make a greater surplus in the end. Right. So in a way we are uh, we, we, we are really uh, very elaborate um, calculation machines. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, with the little, with the little beads, you know the uh, the abacus. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> it's it's hard to accept sometimes because we do have that notion, and uh, we will get to more. Uh, kind of again, we'll, we'll continue to to dissect it. I want to just to you know to read you guys something from another perspective. As we see, science is gradually catching up to some of the concepts that Kabbalists have been describing you know, millennia ago, uh, and just uh, a, a little over a year ago, there was a study about, uh, about free will. Uh, we're not going to get into the, into the uh, 
particulars of it. Uh, you can read it, uh, read, read up on it online if you want. Um, uh, there's a guy called Sam Harris who wrote about it in a book called Free Will. You don't need to, to read it. Like we can save you the read. But listen to what scientists are saying today. A person's conscious thoughts, intentions, and efforts at every moment are preceded by causes of which he is unaware. What is more, they are preceded by deep causes, genes, childhood experiences, etc., for which no one, however evil, can be held responsible. Our ignorance of both sets of facts gives rise to more to moral illusions, and yet many people worry that it is necessary to believe in free will, especially in the process of raising children. So even scientists are, are uh, proving through experimentation, you know, neuroscientific experimentation studies, that things are happening even before we make what we call a free choice. So something else is at play here. What is what is what is at play here? What is, what is that quality that is moving us, that is getting, uh, uh, as, the, as the friends wrote, you know, getting someone to get up and, and shop for something, to exercise, to open a book and read something before the lesson, to not trim your beard or to trim your beard. What is that? What is that mechanism that is controlling it if it's not, uh, as we like to call it, free choice? Absolutely. And, and a lot of people, of course, are going to argue uh, that, uh, hell, I'm, I, I didn't really, you know, uh, choose uh, pleasure at a, any and every given moment of my life. Just for example, I went and, you know, uh, exerted myself or, or sacrificed myself for, 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 for a certain number, number of years in order to achieve something greater. For example, I, I gave birth to a child and now I'm working very hard in order, in order to reap the reward of, of a child growing up, right? Uh, an excellent example would be of, uh, of, of a kid uh, who, who goes to school and wants to become a lawyer. Uh, so all the kids are going out partying, they're, you know, drinking alcohol, you know, smoking weed, uh, you know, partying, dancing, meeting girls, everything in between, right? And that kid sits at home and he studies day and night. For how many years? How many years do do, do lawyers? Four, four years at least. Four, four years is, is just the, the initial college. I'm pretty yeah. sure there's another eight or so okay. that come afterwards, right? A lot of years, <laughs> in other words, right? Uh, uh, that, that kid is sitting down and studying this science. What does he want to achieve with it? How is, how is it possible that a person uh, pushes away so much of the pleasure of, of his golden years, really, uh, uh, everything that, that his youth has to promise in order to achieve something else. Right? So he wants to become a lawyer and he goes ahead and uh, forgets about social life altogether, forgets about all of the fun that, that the young people uh, of his age are having because he wants to become a lawyer. Let's try another example. Um, uh, I, am, uh, I want to go on vacation. Right, I've heard uh, that uh, there's, there's a lovely there's a lovely vacation package that's out there. I can't afford it yet. What do I do with it? Well, I take on a second job, right? I sacrifice myself. I sacrifice the rest. I sacrifice the time of the family. Uh, you name it. You know, any any type of fun that I could possibly have. I take that second job in order to earn that extra money, in order to go on vacation. Again, that calculation is still there. I am sacrificing something in order to receive something in return. But there is one little caveat. I am expecting, I am expecting that the return, the dividend from that transaction is going to be greater than what I am investing. I am not going to, to you know, work 10 hours, uh, you know, within a day in order to receive, I don't know, uh, 25 cents for it, right? Most certainly not. No one would ever do it. But if I know that there is a hefty sum out there and I need that sum, I'm going to work for it. And this is, this is kind of like the, the other side to this, to this calcula calculating mechanism that we have within us, within that, that will to receive. That I need to invest myself, exert myself, sacrifice certain part of my peace, of my rest, of my pleasure, in order to receive a greater pleasure in the end. So that actually, <clears throat> that actually all those examples of Vlad just related, they, um, 
they are, actually, interestingly, they point to a very nice difference between humans and animals. The beginning of what we consider a human, which is the ability to endure some pain, some discomfort, some suffering now for the hope of something better in the future. Right? Yes, so, sir. however, that, that quality, which makes us more human than animals, still doesn't uh, discount the basic program of the machine, which is more pleasure than effort. Right? As, as, we, can, as we can see. <laughs> I mean, that calculation never leaves us. Right? It's, uh, it's something that we constantly do at every waking moment. Uh, and it's done unconsciously. So all the friends that have given us all the examples of what they were doing, we guarantee to you that all those actions, consciously or subconsciously, were designed to bring you more pleasure than you currently had. If you had the sensation of pleasure just sitting and doing nothing, you would do nothing. The only reason we get up, we move, is because our bodies and everything around us gives us those, those promises, those cues for this promised pleasure. And this is the way the whole world really operates. If, if, if the return is not greater than the, the investment, the, the action is, is deemed not worthy taking. I want to read this thing also from the, the Freedom. Uh, Page 376, by the way. Right. A, a very apt, uh, uh, not to discourage anyone. <laughs> but Baal Sulam says, when we examine the acts of an individual, we shall find them compulsory. He is compelled to do them and has no freedom of choice. In a sense, he is like a stew cooking on a stove. It has no choice but to cook. And it must cook because providence has harnessed life with two chains, pleasure and pain. So we always go after the pleasure, the pleasure that specifically fits that little clee, that little, you know, dent within, within my desire, that lack that, that, that I, precise lack that I need. Or whips me from behind and I run away from that certain pain, that certain suffering that I want to avoid. So, so, so suddenly when you look back at your day or even recent life, uh, freedom is not so obvious anymore. And, uh, you know, when we see those countries, nations, organizations, you know, putting this you know, freedom on their banner, it's really, it becomes something much more relative. Than, than an absolute quality of freedom. Uh, and if we boil it down to the basic formula that Kabbalah has given us, we're a desire to receive. We seek pleasure. That's, that's what it is. We can assume that any action a person does, myself included, Vlad included, everyone in this world, we're doing it because of the promise of pleasure. So there's nothing, um, you, you may say, uh, to put it bluntly, there's nothing original there. All the creatures are seeking pleasure. And the ways by which we seek pleasure, unfortunately, even those are not so free. And we'll see, we'll see it uh, shortly. <clears throat> I wonder if, um, if we have any questions. We don't have any questions oh, yet. Good. Well, there, there's, there's, there's a statement, really. It has a question mark in the end. Uh, uh, a student asked, no pain, no gain. I believe, right? Okay, interesting. Yeah, Aruka from Ontario said, no pain, no gain. Well, I guess. <laughs> and also, <laughs> Edgar asks, so there's only the perception of freedom. Uh, so far, it seems so, Edgar. <laughs> let's, let's, let's delve a little deeper and see, see what, we, what we get out of it. I mean, if you look at life, uh, and really, all we have to do is look at our own lives, but you can look at around, around the world. You, you know, humans have uh, always tried to seek right more freedom, you know, greater degrees of, free of freedom, in the hopes of attaining greater degrees of pleasure. But as we can see from the examples around us, we are not doing that well, right? Most well, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, think of that uh, kid, right, that went four mm -hmm. years to school to, to study to become a lawyer, and then only to come out of school so excited with his. 
you know, now the, I'm going to be a lawyer and I'll make so the, much money. With your right? diploma and everything. <laughs> Only to discover that there are 40,000 other lawyers who gradu graduated with you. And only 10,000 jobs. Right. <laughs> so, you know, you made all the calculations. You put We're not saying don't go to college, but we are saying that we make calculations, but, but those are not, those, they are based on the fact that we lack information. So we don't want to confuse freedom of choice with lack of information, meaning with guessing. So... Uh, because clearly, if you were given all the information, if that, that kid would have been given all the information that in four years' time there would be more job seekers than jobs, he would have chosen something else. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's just a lack of... Or, or that person who, who exerts so, so much time and effort and he blood and sweat, really, to, to, to have that second job and work extra hours and sacrificing all of this time and uh, his strength to, to, to save up extra money on vacation. And then he gets on vacation, and uh, he breaks his ankle there, right? It rains there all day, and he gets Montezuma's revenge. He gets diarrhea all throughout the whole, you know, stay, yeah. wherever it is that he's going, right? right? It's, uh, it's something that he could not predict. Nevertheless, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's something, it's an example of, uh, of, uh, um, of the fact that we are very often investing into something, into that certain promise of pleasure, promise of benefit. We sacrifice so much, but in the end, uh, you know, uh, results may vary. Uh, we, we, we're not exactly sure what, what the actual reality is going to return to us. Um. Uh, uh, Margaret from Mexico is asking, so whatever we decide to do in order to attain pleasure cannot be called freedom? And why can it not be called freedom? Yeah, it's an, it's, it's an excellent question, uh, Margot. Um, the, the, um, the reason why it cannot be called freedom is because think, think of a robot, right? Or think of a computer program. That computer program has a specific code written in that makes it behave a specific way in, uh, in, in response to, to stimuli that come toward it. For example, if this button is pressed, then such and such uh, result will, will, will appear. Right? The same thing with humans. If uh, a specific type of pleasure that is catered to that specific type of desire is presented to that person, that person will have no other choice but to go after that desire, after that pleasure. We are pre-programmed to, uh, to follow that, uh, um, that formula. We're stuck within the formula, like Bala Salam says, that we are, we are uh, enslaved, uh, in, uh, incarcerated in that jail of our own desire to receive. We are constantly chasing pleasure, and we cannot do anything about it. As, as, uh, in fact, you could go a step further and say, uh, it's not that, that we're chasing pleasure, rather the, the system is built to kind of... Uh, drive us, you know, using mm -hmm. these two reins of pleasure and pain, in a way. Uh, as Baal Sulam writes, uh, also from page 376 in the Freedom, he says, when all said and done, there is no difference here between man and animal. And if that is the case, there is no free choice whatsoever, but a pulling force, drawing them forward and any bypassing pleasure and rejecting them from painful circumstances. From painful circumstances, and providence leads them to every place it chooses by means of these two forces without asking their opinion in the matter. Absolutely. So, drawing us towards pleasure and, and moving us away from suffering. It's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a, you know, it's a nifty way to you know, get the pieces to move through the maze. If you think about Margot, it. Think, think about it this way. That, uh, that, uh, like, like one of the other students mentioned, that, that, the, the, that the freedom is, is only an illusion. Right, uh, and it, it, it really does seem this way because because um, I, as a human being, I, from my personal perception, I'm thinking that right now I want water. I'm picking up this water and I'm drinking it. Right? What's actually ha what's actually happening on the inside? There is a lack for water that demands not only demands it orders me to pick up this glass and fill myself with water. Why? Because there is a, 
a deficit of liquid in my body right now. We're not, I'm not even talking about the desire to receive the, the, the greater, you know, the greater purpose or all of that. Just on, on a purely physiological level. I need water. The water is right in front of me right here. I am picking it up and I'm drinking it because such is the compulsion. But the thought in my head is, mmm, water, let me have some of that, right? I think I want to have some water. <clears throat> exactly like that. There, no wonder uh, um, the, the desire, the will to receive for the sake of one's own self, the ego, is called Pharaoh. And Israel were called slaves. Israel were enslaved by Pharaoh. Through what? Not through the fact that he was whipping them and telling them what to do. Build those pyramids or build, you know, those cities or whatever that was. No, rather they had an innate desire, an innate need to receive pleasure. And they were simply unaware of the fact that it was Pharaoh who was ordering them to do what they were doing. They thought that they were doing it out of their own volition, out of their own personal free choice. But instead, it was just the, uh, the, the reign of that desire to receive for your own sake that was dictating every single <coughs> movement of their lives. So I just want to you know, make things a little worse. <laughs> oh come on, man! <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As, as if it was hard enough that you know we, we have to obey all the those processes in our bodies, right? We have to go to the bathroom when, when nature calls, right? When it's time <laughs> to give birth, we have to give birth. There's no, there's no nobody is asking your opinion in the matter. Uh, it's hard enough, but apparently, even from the outside, we're kind of closed in, right? It's a closed system. I uh, you know I used to work in advertising for many years. Um, I know. The statistics, you know, a person in New York, for example, if you walk out, you're exposed to anywhere from 3,000 to 16,000 brand messages and various type of communications telling you to do different things, right? Now, you think, no, I'm a discerning person. I have a certain taste. I only look at this and I ignore that and I seek this and not that. It doesn't matter. Nobody is asking us. Those impressions seep into us, whether you're looking at them cons consciously or not. If I'm driving through Times Square, all that stuff, all those billboards, you know, selling everything and anything, they're all going to get into my system, into my system, into the machine, into the calculations, and automatically be added to the calculations. And I will gradually feel myself wanting, you know, to buy certain products and wanting to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, appreciating, uh, you know, a certain kind of feminine beauty. Why? Just because this is the kind of feminine beauty portrayed on those boards, and uh, you know, and I appreciate certain colors and certain sounds, certain all those things, all my tastes, everything is really determined by this constant, you know, pressure from the environment. We're told that Toronto has a question. We need to return to that to that topic, of course, okay. uh, if, if if it's possible to broadcast. By the way, friends, we forgot to remind you that uh, yet again, as usual, uh, during our classes, our friends from Toronto is or have organized the physical meetup for uh, right. uh, for education center students, and students are actually sitting together in the same room. They're communicating with each other, and they they would like to ask a question. Uh, Alex, if it's possible, could you please broadcast the uh, the question? Um, <laughs> while we wait for Toronto, I can, I can see that um, uh, Brenda from New York is asking, so how do you get out of the system? <laughs> Right. That's a good, they're, they're, you know, that's a matrix question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just take the red pill, really. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it, Brenda. We're getting to it. Um, Toronto, uh, anything? If, if Toronto is not ready to, to, to broadcast the question, then... I don't think this is working. Oh, it's working. Oh, it's, working. it's working. It's working. Very good. Oh, it's working. <laughs> Hi. Hello, hello. My name is Paulina. All right. uh, my question is, are we controlled by our desire or by the Creator? Excellent. All right. Excellent. Are we controlled by our desire or by Creator, Leo? Well, <laughs> I mean... What is the difference, really? 
really, if you remember, the, even the, from the very first lessons, uh, there was nothing that was created but a desire and the light that fills it, right? Everything else is, those, is this elaborate experience that we're having, and we'll touch on it later in this lesson. But there is nothing else. There's only the Creator and, and us, this will to receive, this deficiency, this place where there is no you know, presence of the Creator felt, you could say. So <laughs> there is no difference really between the two. Everything comes from above. Everything is inside the system. Uh, we'll see you know, in a few minutes also we'll get to the fact that really everything is really closed in already, right? Everything mm -hmm. is foreseen as, as it's written by our sages. Pauline, all of the systems, everything that, that, we, that revolves around us, everything that works within us, everything was created by that same, by that same source. And uh, uh, that desire to receive that, that we speak about was also created by the Creator and was created this specific, uh, precise, specific way by that same source in order to guide us to the complete correction in the end. So whether, whether it's, it's the Creator who's controlling us or the desire who's controlling us, it's, it's really the same, the same thing in the end. Rather, let's put it this way, that, that the Creator created a system that would operate upon us until we are ready to mature onto something greater. Basically, yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, I would point you to article number one in Shamati. There is none else besides him. Mm -hmm. but there is nothing outside of this. You know, anything you can think of and you can imagine that is influencing you is within that system. Uh, in fact, a very easy way to look at it is, you know, there is myself, right, the way I perceive myself. Around me, there's all this sphere of things, right, that influence me. Still, vegetative, animate, this whole, you know, the planet, all the people on it, the cosmos, the uh, galaxies, stars, the whole thing. And outside of that is what we may refer to as the creator. So he's using that, that middle sphere to, to operate me, us, all of us, right? So we're really, everything we feel is the effect of this thing called the creator, operating on us through everything around us. Um, I want to I wanna recap, unless we have another question from Toronto, I want to do a little recap maybe. Um, well, you, you touched, uh, Leo touched upon a very, a very interesting thing with the billboards and, and advertising and, and the, uh, that whole notion of something being uh, uh, um, influencing our desires, right? Yeah. This brings us to 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 to, uh, to to a very important point of the influence of the society upon the desire to receive. And um, if you really think about it, every single thing that we want, you know, um, just just as an example, today I was I was you know as usual a roast beef sandwich. A roast beef sandwich, yeah. There the we go. one that you loved so much. Exactly, yeah. Um, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have even known about that, that roast beef sandwich if, if uh, my wife didn't tell me about it before. And naturally, I got, you know, I tried it, you know, through all of the things that she said to me about how wonderful it is and succulent and the juices and, and the, uh, the diversity of flavors and everything in between. Everything just, just this bouquet of... Orgasm in your mouth. <laughs> not, you to, know? Not, uh, to mention, uh, not to mention that little sign in the deli that you pass by every day that says the roast beef sandwich. Exactly. Yeah. It, it constantly evokes in me that that need to at least give it a try, right? <laughs> but but um, uh, really, everything that is around us constantly reminds us of the fact that there is a pleasure out there that you should be going after. It's always there. Let's let's get back to the examples of uh, of, of the two of the two people that we spoke about before, right? That same kid who is going to school. What compelled him to go to school? What compelled him to go to school to study law? And what gave him enough strength and and uh, energy and perseverance in order to go through eight or ten years of school? completely forgetting about the golden age of his youth, right? <laughs> what compelled him? What on earth, right? I'm not saying don't go to school. Again, you know, disclaimer. Go to school. Disclaimer, <laughs> yeah, we, we're not saying don't go to school. But, but this example is, is, very, is very interesting because we're talking about a very huge uh, sacrifice that an individual takes in order to achieve something. 
So if someone says that, well, uh, lawyers are well respected, lawyers make a whole ton of money, there's probably great pleasure in defending criminals and divorcing people and right. everything in between. Big house somewhere? Big house, you know, uh, expensive German car. Suits? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a whole image. I mean, not yeah. to mention the gazillion shows on TV glorifying, right, lawyers. Exactly, and, uh, yes. Especially and the reality TV. That, right. that, that well, is and, and, and just, yeah, yeah, but also the dramas, you know, all the prosecutors and this. It's like it's, it's a glorified profession. Absolutely. Who Absolutely. wouldn't be a lawyer, wanna, you know, want to be a lawyer? It's always presented from, from that very positive side that they're fighting for justice, that they're, that, right. that they're, that they're there to, to fight for what's true. And... Um, Naturally, that kid feels compelled that, hey, you know, it resonates somehow with the qualities that I already have within me. I'm a good speaker. I'm very sociable. I have a very uh, discerning mind. I, I don't believe people in there, you know, uh, just, you know, instantly, right? Uh, there's, there's, the, there's a whole bunch of, of, of qualities within that kid that resonate with that profession, he did not all of a sudden wake up one day and said, hey, I want to be whatever. By the way, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. Right? Me too. Why? Because in my generation and then where I was born, being an astronaut was the most important thing among kids. Everyone wanted to be an astronaut. No one cared about the fact that you would have to, you know, uh, puke a bunch of times before you even reach space. No one said that you're going to be crammed in tiny little cabin for, for right. close to a year. In the worst conditions uh, you know, the ever, ever known to mankind. Exactly. It's, uh, no, no one even, even thought about this. We're pilots. People want to be yeah. pilots, well, right? Because, because we were born right, you know, we were, Vlad and I were born about five years after, you know, when America landed on the moon. It was, it was the thing to be, right? I'm not it that was. old, but okay. <laughs> okay. I, I was, but it, no, but it's true. I mean, the the, the, the late '70s, you know, the '70s and early '80s, that had we had this humanity, uh, had this you know obsession with space exploration and all, all the rest of it. So it was on everybody's lips, and naturally, that's what kids want to be. So um, I just want to take because I know because Toronto usually leaves um, to, to do their own oh, that's right. that's local right. workshops. I just want to do a quick recap, and maybe they can stay with us another five minutes because we're going to touch on another important topic for today. Actually, the most important. Yeah, topic. probably the most. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to do just a quick recap. So basically, there, there's us. If you look at this uh, screen, there's us. Uh, what do we have? What comes in? We have on the physical level everything that comes into us. Right? We have the you know the genes and the parents that make decision, right, childhood, um, siblings, environment, friends, school, right, all, all those things. All, all those things that, you know, basically beyond our control, they go in, they, in, they let me just kind of, oops, I totally messed it up. Um, all those things enter and influence me, even before... I'm asked, right? Then you have all those other things that we talked about, like, uh, right, like advertising, um, you know, and I'll say environment in general. All those things also influence me, right? And I, the machine, the machine that's here, I'm forced to work by this algorithm. Maximum pleasure for minimum effort. In order to navigate myself within all of that uh, pressure that I'm being subjected to. And then what comes out, comes out my actions. So my actions are really the, at every moment, they're the sort of the average of all those things that enter me. And the one that kind of wins, you know, the strongest desire manifests into an action. That's really... That's really what it, you know, what it boils down to. So that's the kind of the important takeaway. So, so the major, huge question that comes out of it, and I see some, some similar questions to that, is uh, after all is said and done in this, in, this, uh, in this diagram right here, can I even mention the fact that I can be selfish? If I didn't choose any of this, if I didn't choose what to receive and how to receive and for whose sake to receive, how can it even be called selfish? Exactly. Well, Vlad, the good news is no one is selfish. As we read before from Baal Sulaim, no one is, there is no evil person. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to be evil. 
<laughs> Everybody wakes up thinking or even subconsciously operating on, I want to receive pleasure. And how it's expressed is a result of all those conditions that went, got into it. And in, uh, from Toronto, our students are asking, are students of Kabbalah more free than the rest of humanity? Excellent, excellent question. Wonderful. That's, that's exactly where we're actually heading. <laughs> you know, where is free free will within this seemingly uh, closed system of lack of free will, if I may? Uh, where do we go from here? Okay, so it's 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 uh, it's important um, to maybe in this case to remind us of, of something. So we had what we call state A, First state, yeah. right, and then the last state, state C, and then, can we show the screen, now, Alex, and then somewhere in the middle, state B, where we are, and we go from, you know, we kind of descend to state B, and are required to ascend back to state C. State A and state C, as we know, they, they are uh, equal in the sense that they're those states of perfection, of of this uh, full adhesion. The only difference is, right, our, our consciousness, our, our participation, our awareness, right, all the experience and everything, the, the building this kli that allows us to receive all that pleasure that comes from it. Now, this process, as we said, as it's written in, uh, it's, it's called Pirkei Avot, it says that all is foreseen, yet choice is given, meaning this entire uh, movement from A to B and then from B to C is already predetermined. It's done. It's already in the can, right? It's like it's uh, it's like the film, right? It's shot. It's 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 done. Everything is already predetermined in that system, and um, re <clears throat> really the the reason why we experience this sense of constant change is due to this uh, concept that Kabbalists call re she. I hope you see it. Um, it's basically every stage, every change, every, I'm, I'm, we're making these very kind of large intervals, but you can imagine that this thing is, is working nonstop, every second, every second, right? A new Rashimo is unfolding, it's like this spiral, right, that keeps kind of unfolding, 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 right? So what is this Reshimo? Reshimo, which by the way comes from Hebrew, from the root Roshem, impression. Okay, it's a certain impression. It's it's a very um, at the heart of everything. It's the impression of reality. Think think, think of a cell on uh, on a film, right? On the film reel. You right. Know, every cell represents a certain change, a certain uh, you know uh, something's different between one cell and the other. You know, every frame is different in, in some way. And, and the same thing with Rishimo. Every single moment, every single uh, 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 change that happens within us is uh, uh, provoked by this thing that we call a Rishimo. Because new information enters me about uh, my past, about my present, and about the hopes, my thoughts about the future. Okay, it completely envelops my reality. It makes up the uh, the the, uh, the the material of my reality, pretty much. Because everything that I know, everything that I see, everything that I feel, everything that I experience is contained within that Rishimot. So if the next Rishimot says that I am supposed to feel depressed, I'm going to feel depressed. If the next Rishimo says that I'm supposed to feel, uh, you know, elated and happy and overjoyed, I'm going to feel overjoyed, regardless whether I feel that, you know, I exerted effort toward it or not, regardless whether I thought that I deserved it or not. All of that does not matter. Everything is predetermined, including, by the way, your uh, investment into something. For example, that kid who's going to through eight years of college in order to become a lawyer. Right. right? Every single step of the way is already pre-written, predetermined for him, including that failure of not finding a job. Why is it done to us? Well, first of all, let's take a second to appreciate this system, okay? <laughs> I mean, it, it, re it really, I mean, just to, to understand that there is no 
you know, existence in some world somewhere on a planet with a rich past history and and f some unimaginable future and all the rest of the things that are happening and people, you know, living and dying and all the upheavals. None of those things really, truly exist in an objective sense. Rather, I have an impression of that experience in me. And it's then translated, almost, you could say, projected onto, onto not even in front of me, because I, 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 I don't know what's in front of me, rather on the screen in the back of the head, remember, that we talked about. It's, mm -hmm. you know, those Roshimo, like, they kind of projected on there, and it creates my picture of reality. So, these Roshimo, they constantly, they're like the, the you know, the cogwheels in a, in, a, in, a, in a watch, right, in a Swiss watch. Mm -hmm. And they, they have to go. There's no way. They have to express themselves. They have to unfold. Um, you can look at it um, from maybe from another perspective. Uh, it, it's, it's basically we're like, uh, we're like particles, and we're moving through these, right, these, these, these different fields of uh, influence, right, like, like magnetic fields, different fields, differently charged fields. And every time the field kind of passes and I'm, I'm in the field, I immediately change my direction and I start moving, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have no control. It, it immediately changes my whole perception, my whole reality. Everything kind of shifts in those very rapid clicks, you could say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So uh, maybe before we kind of take this to the next kind of what is it? And mean? by the way, there is, there is key to, to, uh, to freedom of will within Rishimot as well. We're just, we're just getting to it, right. of course. We're just building up. Yes. Um, but maybe, let, let's see if, we, if you guys have questions specifically about those things. So we spoke about the freedom of will, uh, the, the illusion of freedom of will, uh, how our machine is built, and we spoke about the Reshimo. Uh, if you have any questions on those things, please let us know so we can address them. We want to make sure that everything is, is perfectly clear because those things, uh, they play an essential part as Vlad said in the beginning, in our development, our spiritual development. I mean, from now till the end of, of the correction, the end of this process, we will be constantly working with this concept of free will, freedom of choice. Where is it exactly? Because, spoiler alert, there is... There is freedom of will. There so is. The, the there question is. of Toronto, yes, Kabbalists have, have that very unique ability of, of choosing freely. And uh, so Matthew from Vermont is asking, so a Reshimo could be considered a recollection? A recollection. It could possibly be, be, be considered a recollection, but it's much more than that as well. Uh, think of it this way, that... Um, Maybe a blueprint. What is, Maybe a blueprint? A blueprint would be yeah, pr pr probably closer. A blueprint of everything that has existed before this very moment and the blueprint for what exists right now, and also a blueprint for everything that I think and hope and expect will happen in the future. Think of it this way, that um, back, you know, let's, let's go a couple of lessons back, right? The uh, perception of reality. We're told that the reality that we see is really, you know, imaginary. Right? It's an imaginary reality, and we see it because we are, you know, we have a certain sensory organ within, within, within us, an uncorrected sensory organ that perceives it in this specific way. Okay? And in reality, in true reality, in spiritual reality, in the complete perfect reality, we exist in complete adhesion with the Maker. Right? So wait, uh, where's Hitler? Where's uh, Mao Zedong? Where is uh, where's Stalin? We're st still talking about 20th century. I'm not even talking about <laughs> Alexander the Great and you know and Napoleon and everything everything else that happened. The Agricultural Ice revolution, the Ice, Ice Age, Age, yeah, the mammoths, all that stuff, right? What happened to that? Did that actually take place or not? How about this? What about yesterday when I woke up and uh, and had a really bad headache? Did that happen? Was that real or not? Well. It's real if that Rishimo includes that information within it. Or another way to say it, it's real just like a scene in the play is very real for the actor. But is it real? You know, again, everything, we see that everything is relative. It, it, and it's relative because we are limited in our 
perception. This brings us back again and again to you know, the thought of creation and then the purpose of creation. The Creator is trying to tell us, look, this is not the whole thing. This is not the whole picture. There's a very nice elaborate system in place and it's, uh, it's clicking away and we're in it and it's just waiting for us to reach the right desire with which we can hope to start exiting this this kind of uh, incubator. I, I don't think it's a, it's a bad system. It's a great system. There are a few amazing advantages to mm -hmm. living in this world um, that allows to perform certain work uh, which you would not be able to do in the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. We'll get to it later on in the course. But I, I like the example from, from, uh, from the fifth element. I'm sure you saw it, uh, where, where this alien girl, Lilu, uh, uh, gets up to speed on what has happened uh, in, you know, in, on Earth uh, through all of these thousands of years. And she watches this, this highlight reel, which moves very, 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 very fast, and she comes to, to, to completely, fully sense it as though she actually experienced it. Right. You know, think of a robot that, that is finally, you know, all of the programming, everything is put on, the, 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 um, the software is already, you know, updated, the patch is, is, is already in, the last thing, you just turn on the robot, the robot wakes up and is like, okay, today is, you know, June 17th, uh, 2006, I live in Uganda, you know, I am a businessman, I, well, you, you know what I mean, right? This is precisely what the Rishimo is, it's, it's a, it's a program that injects into us the sensation of reality around us and the understanding of our own selves. So, uh, Michael from Florida is asking, so life is a movie that we are create, I or we are creating from our thoughts and, and human flaws that manifest as our reality. You could look at it as in this way, except again, there's one force that's creating everything, which is the creator. We play a role in it, but so far, up to this point, our role was not a free choice kind of role. We, we were <laughs> just we were just mere spectators. Let's put actors, it this way. basically. Yeah. You, you're an actor in a play. You know, the guy in Macbeth has to die at the end. I mean, there's no, there's no, you know, you can't. It's all predetermined. But how it happens, how he relates to it, and this is the beginning of the key. Exactly. How do you relate to it? That already begins to open a different kind of doorway, right? Something completely different. And um, to, uh, to also, as um, uh, Ken from Texas is asking, can we eliminate or lose Reshimo? We most certainly can't, but we can <laughs> do something with them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What can we do with them, Vlad? What can we do with those Reshimo? We can recognize, we can recognize that this Reshimo was given to me from the above. I will completely uh, give myself up to this Rishimo because it was given to me by the Creator, and I will completely surrender to the fact that that I am seeing it from a completely wrong perspective. That if I am correct, if I were to correct myself. If I were to correct myself with the spiritual environment, as, as we spoke in the past, you know, we spoke about the books, the Rav, and the group, right? The spiritual environment, the three very important facets of it. If I use that environment correctly, I will be able to affect how I am viewing this Rishimot. And, and as a result, I am correcting it. Each and every Rishimot that descends and uh, uh, opens itself up, right? Gets, gets, uh, you know, gets revealed to me. Is still unrealized. How is it unrealized? What is missing in that Rishimot? Our participation is missing. The correct participation. Because right now, we just respond to it from our very limited uh, kelim. Remember, we only have the one kli, the will to receive. I want pleasure, me, me, me. That's how I see everything. That's how I respond to everything that's happening. I respond to it from this perspective only. So uh, I'm stuck, I'm locked in this movie and I'm, f I'm, I'm forced to kind of sit through it and let those scenes play out and some of them can be very painful because there is a purpose. 
they're not just randomly painful. It's not like we're here to be you know, inflicted with you know horrible pain for someone's pleasure. Rather, they're all gradually bringing humanity and all this human experience, everything, into right into this new phase, into a phase where we can start to correct, to come closer, to become similar, right, in our attitude to the Creator. And this, this brings us to a very important point, that if you think of a Rishimot, and of course it's, it's a very silly example, but nevertheless, <laughs> right, as a, as a cell, as a frame in a reel, right, and, you know, it is projected, you know, onto me, uh, you know, through, through a certain set of lenses, through, with the light and everything in between. How do I receive it? Through which lens do I receive it? My usual standard lens that I was given by birth, through birth, is desire to receive for my own sake. This is precisely why that Rishimot is uncorrected. This is precisely why this Rishimot very often is frightening, painful, painful, brings me a ton of suffering, gives me a lot of insecurity and fear and uncertainty, you name it, all of the ailments of our world. Uh, that reality that is projected onto me of who I am and what the world is all about is not incorrect by definition. What is incorrect is the lens through which I am perceiving it. So where is the free will? So we can look at it, if we look at this world... <clears throat> Sorry, I'm terrible. Let's draw a line here. So, in this world, we are operated according, as we said, according to um, what Kabbalists call. I mean, we talk about pleasure and pain, but it's basically we can also write it bitter and sweet. All right? Let's put it like that. Okay. So this is my paradigm. In this world, I run away. I run away from the bitter, and I chase the sweet. Clearly, as we saw through all the examples in the, in the lesson, that chase, that you know, that kind of like a blind—it's uh, uh, not even a chase. It's more like a, this, you know, random running around. I don't know. This running around is not producing the desired effect. I mean, we're not getting more pleasure, actually. We're, we're getting, you know, more of the bitter. But we keep running away. So this, these were the reins that govern us. And they govern us because they work directly on our will to receive, our ego. But if we want to come out of this, we need to adopt a new paradigm, a new system, right? And that's a system of true versus truth, I guess, would be better, right? Truth, better yeah, I mean, yeah. Truth versus, yeah. Truth versus false. Falsehood. Oh, you see, that's why, that's why I wanted to... <coughs> Can I go with true and false? It's, there's no room, no real estate here. I'm, I'm going to go with true or false. Okay. Okay. So, this is a different paradigm altogether. Right? So, when I, when I, now, if I'm already have a goal of, of working with this paradigm, I'm already moving in a different direction. Because I, now I, I, I want to make, exert an effort to not obey these, you know, these, these reins that were placed on my will to receive that, that actually paint this reality for me. But rather, I want to seek something else. I want, to seek, I want to start to guide my life based on a different set of ideals, right? A different ideology, you could say. One where I seek the truth. What is truthful versus what is false? And if Kabbalists tell us this world of bitter and sweet, that corporeal world, this is all an illusion, a dream. It's, it's, only, it's only here to, become a, to be a starting point for something. It's not the thing itself. Then... Uh, I can consider this thing as false and a spiritual world as true. So I, I'm starting to ask myself, okay, what are the values, what are the ideas, what are the tools, the means by which I can get into this true world versus staying in this false world? So now I, I'm already starting to arrange myself differently towards this 
this world, right? And now, the nice thing is what Kabbalists are telling us is, you know what? Those Rashimo are going to keep spinning. And, and they will push us because if we go back, right? From this is the thought of creation and this is the purpose. So those Rashimo are going to push us in this direction. We're going to move. We're going to get squeezed through this right mm -hmm. process. So the question is, are we, are we going to, are we going to participate consciously, willingly, really, you know, go for it, hasten it, accelerate it, or are we going to ignore the signs, ignore our, those, those inner desires? And Let the Rishimot steamroll us. Exactly. It's really like, you know, the easiest example, it's like when, when we were kids and we had to go to school. I have to go through, you know, fourth grade. I can kick and scream and put so much energy to fight it, but ultimately I have to go and I'm going to have to sit down and buckle down and study late and go to the test and all, you know, and get, you know, blows from my parents and discipline from this and that. all the rest to get to the fifth grade. Or I can decide I want to do it. This is not this is not my point of this is not where you know <laughs> this, this is not it. I'm going to you know just sit down, do the assignments from school, pass the test, and move on. So you can have the same experience, the two children going through the same really, ob you know, objective experience of going through fourth grade, but one will suffer through it and one can really breeze through it. It's, uh, it's really, and in, in, in spiritual work, the, the breezing through it is, is actually breathing because we start to rise above space and time, all those limitations of the world to receive. So we really are, you know, moving away. So by by starting to set our goals on on this new paradigm of true versus false versus bitter versus you know and sweet i'm already saying i want to choose this other path right that's already and the, the names of those paths are uh, you know aptly the path of suffering and the path of light in other words anything and everything that i will that i will continue perceiving as bitter or sweet will be the path of suffering it will be that continuation of of the rishimot uh, uh, unfolding over and over and over one after another and neither one of them getting realized what is this realization of rishimot it is a, it is the, the the one where i am able to find the force of the creator the bestowing force in that reality there are a lot of amazing questions here. Let's try to kind of work through some of them, right? Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, Anne from Peru. Is this why history repeats itself? It could, it could not. We may <laughs> never know, as a matter of fact. But history does have a tendency to repeat itself, and uh, it, it sometimes perplexes us. Um, well, again, we will see that processes... All processes in nature obey the same rules. So those processes, you know, they just unfold. They keep unfolding. Uh, so what, what changes or what has an opportunity to change is, again, our attitude towards it. The, the, the event themselves don't need to, you know, the stimulations can be the same, stimulus, the same stimuli. And it will just, if, unless I participate consciously, it will produce the same effect, but, you know, with different colors, you know. It used to be bow and arrow, and now it's uh, nukes. But it's not. It's the same, you know. It's the same action. The same, same intention. It's the, exactly. the, 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 the underlying fact is that, that there is hatred between people, and it continues on in this slightly different form. But, but, the, but the essence is pretty much the same. Does it mean that Hitler and Stalin belong to predetermined events? Oh, most certainly. Absolutely. Everything was predetermined, including the fact that you woke up this morning. <laughs> you were supposed to wake up this morning, so you woke up. If, you, if that wasn't, wasn't pre-written for you to wake up this morning, you wouldn't have woken up. Every single breath that we take is predetermined. Everything, it's, it's, we, we, we really uh, underappreciate and take for granted the fact that, that the Creator uh, and, and, and the force uh, that, 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 uh, you know, that brings everything to life is working every single millisecond. It's, it's just, it's constantly omnipresent. Um, and 
Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say, you know, just a general kind of statement, you know, relax. You know, we, we can relax. Uh, not in the sense of I can lie on my back. You can try. It's not going to work. But you can relax in the sense that, you know, instead of tr trying to correct all those things kind of externally as we see in the world, all those things that are broken and not working, we can start to see it for what they are. Those are, those are, those are necessary expressions of the system to get us to start changing our attitude, not for us to run and fix them. Do you really think the Creator needs us to go and fix some, you know, and bring, you know, I take some food from here and bring it there, and I, I, I build this here, and, you know, this, this, He created everything. He can fix everything in a, in a, in a heartbeat. Um, you know, and, and we're not talking about, you know, miracles from the cloud. Within this world, the system, we have every possible thing we need to have the perfect life, really. I mean, think about Coca-Cola can get Coca-Cola to everywhere in the world. So what? We can't get fresh water and food to everyone in the world? <laughs> it's, it, it, yeah, it's just a small example, you know. Uh, but, but really, this is, uh, uh, we're, not, we're not placed here in order to scramble and, you know, you know t t take care of things. Everything is already set. We have, we're here to, now with this new desire, to start asking the right questions, start aiming ourselves where the Creator is, is, is kind of calling us, you know, which is to, you know, get to adhesion with the Creator, with that force, with that upper force that governs everything. And from Peru, excellent question. Do we have to go through all the steps, either breezing through them or through struggles? Yes. Is there any way to jump steps? Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, just like a child uh, in the womb, and even outside the womb, cannot jump, uh, you, you can't, you know, not only you don't jump, if you look at an embryo in the womb, it actually goes through all the stages of all life on earth. You will see it goes through a, a shape like an, uh, you know, like a fish, and then an amphibian, and then a, like a, 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 you know, a, like a creature with vertebrae, and then it goes through all those things, everything. We all go through everything. There's no jumping, there's no skipping. There is accelerating, and that is the important part. Exactly. Because the slow process of correction is that we will continue sitting here and, you know, not, not correcting our own selves, not correcting our perception, not trying to generate that, 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 uh, uh, that, uh, that quality of bestowal within us, not changing within. And the life will continue passing, and the Rishimot will continue coming up, popping up. Okay, there, today is a new day. Here is the new sensation, new feeling, a new thing that I know, a new thing that I thought. Basically, life, right? Rishimot is just life. But the life will continue moving forward, and I will not do anything with it. And in the end, I will still be forced into correction, but it's going to be at a great cost. It's going to be through great pain, through great suffering, through, uh, like Bala Salaam says, after the Third and the Fourth World War. So, Bala Salaam, not, not even talking about the fact that the Third war, World War may happen. He already speaks about the Fourth World War. And Albert Einstein, interestingly, said that, I don't know, I'm not talking about the Third World War. I'm only wondering if the Fourth World War is going to be, I only know that the Fourth World War is going going to be fought with sticks and stones. Exactly. Right? So, so just, just uh, think of, of, of all the potential that we have for complete and utter destruction of the planet and of the lives that we have here, and also all the potential that we have to make everything perfect and beautiful. And all of it depends not on, um, on, on, uh, on, on fights and on armies and on diplomacy and on philosophy or anything in between. It has something to do with what we feel inside and what qualities we are perceiving the world with. Because remember, outside of us, there is nothing but the Creator. There is nothing but complete and perfect reality that exists. And all we need to do is just perceive it with that correct intention, with that correct vision, with that correct lens. Uh, Brenda uh, is asking, uh, uh, so what happens if I die and I don't correct myself before I die? Will I remember my past life so that I could correct myself? I want to do this to do this this lifetime. That's a very good desire. That's all you need. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Kabbalists, uh, you know, tell us that you know a, a person can uh, acquire his world 
I'm going to say his world, you know, the spiritual world uh, uh, in one hour. So, obviously, there are different conditions and circumstances, but absolutely, if you were given a point in the heart in this life, and, and given meaning it's awakened in you, you have the conditions to attain spirituality in this life. Uh, so, absolutely, we should be grateful, you know, that we're, you know, that we're even, you know, we're, we're given that, you know. It, it could have been given to someone else, and we could have been trudging along, uh, like the rest of humanity for maybe another life or two or a hundred. Uh, but instead, you're here. You have those questions. Remember those questions. Remember that desire. Uh, even when at times when you think the other things that happen in life that kind of take precedence and distract you from this. Remember that point because, you know, this is the beginning of something truly great. Um, it's time for announcements. It's time for announcements, right? There's so many... Uh, there's a lot of lovely questions, and friends, yeah. also keep in mind that, that uh, first of all, um, this is a very rough and controversial topic. <laughs> also, another thing to keep in mind is that the question of the freedom of will, as we said in the uh, introduction to the class, is going to follow you until complete correction. Not even, not even uh, the first sensation of spirituality, but until complete correction. It's a very deep and very complex topic. The uh, freedom of will, um, that, that freedom that we're trying to find, we're trying to put our finger on, it's so elusive because if you think to yourself that, you know, yes, I found it right there. I made the conscious freedom to choose light over darkness. I made the conscious choice to choose truth versus falsehood and, you know, sensation of bitterness and, and, and sweetness, you know. Even there, there is a caveat and says, wait a minute, but who forced me to do it? Who gave me that, uh, um, who compulsed me to, to, to start that train of thought that brought me to this choice? So, um, the Creator is constantly including Himself in every single thought that we have. And every single time we try to escape Him, we realize that we cannot escape the Creator. This is just a, uh, a little, uh, you know, taste uh, for you, friends, to realize that, that this process is, is uh, very complex and also very interesting because the Creator is always there. And for us to really detach ourselves from the Creator and to make a, a truly conscious choice is a very, very big effort, but also something that produces just fireworks of results. Something that, that, that really, uh, you know, makes us unique just the way He is. And, um, uh, and maybe uh, to remind everyone again to Relax. Yeah. <laughs> chillax. <laughs> chillax. Completely chillax. Because uh, remember, we're not talking about morals or laws of you know that humans make in order to better their lives here corporeally. All those things have nothing to do with w with the with the Rashimo. Those are just the automatic reactions to to what's happening to 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 to, the, to that stimulation, that Rashimo, that impression awakens in us, and we tr we scramble as humans to to. To uh, you know, um, uh, kind of you know, get the best you know, arrange the, con the external conditions, so to speak, the at best the best possible way for our, for maximum pleasure. But it has nothing to do those ideas of, of what we call uh, you know corporeal l laws and morals and codes of ethics have nothing to do with the Rashimo. There there is no uh, good or, or bad in that sense because we're not talking in that equation of bitter and sweet that affects my ego. In this way, that all the laws, all the you know, morals, ethics are all based on because that. Because the true existence exists way above. Way that. above. Above, yeah. above that so. discernment of bitter and sweet, which is our ego, and uh, the the true I, the true you know, who am I, where am I from, and what is my purpose in life, exists in a plane above that, and it's a spiritual plane where I do not think of myself, but only of others. And on this note, let's read some, yeah, uh, have some, announcements. some announcements. Your next lesson will be on Sunday, May 17th. B'nai Baruch Kabbalah centers and campuses in North America are offering opportunities for you to meet, socialize, or study with other students of Kabbalah. Currently, we have events and lessons planned for Brooklyn, New York, Orlando, Florida, 
San Francisco, and Los Angeles, California. Invite your friends or family who might be interested. Visit campus.kabbalah.info for details of the upcoming events. And of course, you know, us here in New, in New York, uh, your, your instructors will be very happy to see you and meet you in person and of course talk to you and answer all of your questions and of course become friends with you, which is the most important aspect of it. Plans for the North America Kabbalah Convention have been finalized. It's a very, very important and big news for us. That's, by the way, the website for the for the mm -hmm. physical campus. And, and by the way, guys, it's not just physical campus. It will list all the upcoming events, so including uh, eventually all the virtual events will also be, be listed here. So just check back regularly. It's a good source to know what's happening around, around you if you live close, relatively close mm -hmm. to a physical center. Uh, it's very important. So plans for the North American Kabbalah Convention have been finalized. It'll, it will be in Persephone, New Jersey on July 24th through 26th. Join us for three days of lessons with Dr. Lightman, Kabbalistic music, activities, and more. There will likely also be a lesson or event on Thursday night before the Congress starts. We will keep you posted as more information becomes available. There's a lot we can say about conventions. These are the, the, uh, the highlights of, of, uh, of, of our path, really, because those are the moments when all the people with the points in the hearts are gathering together in one place and spend the weekend together, you know, listening to lessons, you know, uh, conducting workshops together, connecting on a much deeper level. And that, that actual physical presence with each other means a whole lot. And you will see the, and reap the benefit of really, truly being immersed in a, in a Kabbalistic spiritual society. The, the, you will not, you will not really get the taste of what it means to be in a Kabbalistic society. Un unless un un until you you attend the Kabbalistic convention. So more on this later. Of course, we still have some time to 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 talk about it. And please take any unanswered questions to the forum, where our instructors and moderators will answer them for you. Q Leo's uh, conclusion. Contemplate this lesson: the importance of the environment. Choose your environment wisely. And good night. We'll see you next week.